Hi guys, my name is Dan Lopatka. I am a professional bassist from Chicago, Illinois. Um, and just to tell you a little bit about my background, um, I have uh, two degrees in jazz performance, a bachelor's and a master's degree. And uh, I currently compose for a video game company called Pickle Feet Games. If you guys feel so inclined, go check out Pickle Feet Games on uh, you know, all the social medias. Give them a like, give them a follow. Um, so anyway, today we are doing. We are here for the panel, Songs of Time, exploring the man behind the music of the Legend of Zelda. It's it's a very exciting thing. So last year I was here. Was anybody at my panel last year? Oh, cool! Hey, thank you guys for coming back. Appreciate it. So last year um, I did a uh, a deep dive into the work of Nobuo Oimatsu, who uh, wrote a hefty majority of the music for Final Fantasy. And, you know, I left that, and I was, you know, after I was coming home from MAGFest and feeling upset about going home from MAGFest, I was trying to think of what, you know, what could we do next year? What's something that would be, you know, another, another just great panel? Um, and so, you know, if you're going to do Nobuo, who's like the Beethoven, of video game music, you kind of have to do the Mozart of video game music, right? So we're doing Koji Kondo today, and and what I feel the, one of the best ways to understand uh, a person, a composer specifically, is to look at their compositions. Just like looking, you know, understanding an author is to look at, you know, what they've written. And you can understand a lot about somebody. You can understand whether they're, you know, quirky, they're serious, and or what their sense of humor is, etc. So I began asking myself, what does Kondo do exceptionally well? I mean, obviously he does plenty exceptionally well. He does, you know, so many memorable songs, lots of beautiful orchestrations. But the thing that I came to were sound effects and music cues. Sound effects and music cues, something that he does exceptionally well. And I admire people who do this exceptionally well because in general, in general, writing, writing little two-second pieces of music, you have to cram so much meaning into those two seconds of music. It's, it's really amazing, anybody who does it. So let's first understand about sound effects. Let's understand what they do and what they are and all of that. So a sound effect represents the action that's occurring and also conveys to the listener the emotion that they should be feeling. Represents the action and conveys to the listener the emotion they should be feeling. And so we have sound effects and music cues all around us all the time. We don't just have them in games, right? We also have them in f on our phones, right? If we get a text message or something, we hear a little some sort of uh, something to signal that we just got a text message or got a call, right? And there's, uh, we hear them on, t you know, when we turn on our TV, when we turn on a computer, when the ATM machine wants us to take back our card, you know, all of those things. And all of them convey to us some sort of message. They all convey what, what we should be doing or what is happening and also how we should feel about that. The ATM machine is angry at us. We should feel upset, so we should have to retrieve it. Anyway, so how do you convey meaning musically? How do you convey meaning musically? Well, there are musical elements that carry specific meanings based on how they've been used in our culture. Musical elements carry specific meanings based on how they've been used inside our culture. So when we hear something, think about like, when you watched a movie that had a happy ending, right? Or a TV show, something that has a happy ending. All of you are probably thinking right now of a different, a different ending, a different piece of music, right? But probably it sounds triumphant. Probably it sounds happy. Probably it sounds exciting. And there's something, there's a, there's a common thread between all of those things. There's a reason, there's a musical reason that the composer knows the composer has thrown in there to make you feel that way when you hear that. So repetition, these things are, are 
culturally, these meanings are culturally conditioned. Repetition to meaning. When we see something enough and hear, uh, you know, if we see something scary and we hear a diminished chord. Does anybody know what diminished means? Just anybody? Just, just get an idea of who knows music theory and who doesn't? Okay, that's okay. Totally great. If we hear a diminished chord and we, hear something sc and we see something scary, then okay. Would that, we see that enough times that when we hear a diminished chord, that's what the feeling that we're going to feel there. Same with like major chords and minor chords and augmented chords. They all have specific meaning built into them, which we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. Now, some of that meaning is inherent or scientifically based. Um, some of that meaning is, is uh, you know, if you, if you really dig into it, you can look at how the overtones interact with one another and they interact in such a way that f makes us feel uncomfortable or something like that, um, or that makes us feel uh, comfortable. Um, but we're not, but, but what we're mainly talking about today is the uh, cultural conditioning. Uh, as, sorry, is that the, so, so music, sorry folks, music is not a universal language. That's the point we're trying to make here. Uni music is not a universal language. I hear that all the time. Who has heard that music is a universal language? So many people, right? So that's something that's said all the time, but really that's not the case. Music has a specific meaning based on the culture that it's inside, right? Okay. So when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about what sort of sound effects can we look at? Well, before we jump into some good old Zelda sound effects, before we jump into some good old Koji Kondo, how about let's start with something like this? <laughs> okay, so what is that? What is that? Anybody know? Windows! Windows. It's specifically, it's the Windows XP logon sound, okay, which we have written out here, and yes, <laughs> yes, I did write it out. So, let's get our, oh, we had, oh, this is so great. Okay, so we have our laser pointer here. That's so wonderful. Great. So let's just hear this, let's just hear this one more time. Okay, can everybody hear that in the back? All good? You've probably heard it enough times before, except for you Mac users who are probably like, this is blasphemy. <laughs> okay. So this little, this little, this little, not even like second of music has some elements built into it. Has some elements built into it. And so the first thing that we have is the melody. The melody this, the, uh, is all the way up here. Bum, bum, that part. We have an A flat going up to an E flat. A flat up to E flat. Okay, that's our melody. We'll get back to that in just a moment. We also have our second element. We have a bottom voice, the bass voice, which is right down here. They're just playing an A flat. It's probably like you know some low string, something like that. And then we have we have uh, what sounds like on the recording maybe some cellos or something like that, and they're playing a C and an E flat, a C and an E flat right in the middle. Okay. So before we, jump, before we jump into that, the notes that we have here are an A flat, a C, and an E flat. Does anybody know what an A flat, a C, and an E flat put together are? A flat major? You are correct. It's an A flat major. <laughs> so we have the notes that we have here are an A flat major chord, right? Now. So with the A flat major chord, major usually, major chords have various emotions attached to them. Uh, who, who can tell me any of those? Is, is any, anybody can tell me some, uh, who knows maybe, has heard a major chord and knows major chords and knows what they usually uh, emotionally relate to? Yes, sir. Happiness. Happiness, okay, happiness, I'll buy that. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Triumph, great. Yeah, courageous. Okay, great. These are all really good. So, major oftentimes is happy, bright, light, right? Versus minor. So, those of you who don't know like how major sounds and how minor sounds, here's kind of a quick, 
quick little idea. So this is the major windows on piano. Okay, great. This is the minor window. Same chord, just one, or excuse me, same thing, just one note different. Ooh. <laughs> Microsoft went bankrupt. <laughs> Mac users are so happy. Okay, so, so that's, kind of our, that's kind of our difference, major and minor. Major, you, generally speaking, we hear that as being happy, as, ex, as excited, all that. Minor, we usually hear as like sad or dismal or, or something like that. Okay, so the next thing that we have to, to, hear, to talk about here, so we have this major chord, but we also have this melody, right? We have this two-note melody. Now, these two notes, an A-flat and an E-flat, does any, any theory people know what that, what interval that is? Perfect fifth. fifth. Hey yo, <laughs> melody outlines a perfect fifth. Okay, so who can tell me where we've heard a perfect fifth? What melodies have we heard a perfect fifth in? Yes, sir. Star Wars. Star Wars. Wait, ba. Eh, I can't sing today. Ba 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 da 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 ba ba. Right, those first two notes, perfect fifth. Ba ba. Right. Okay. So somebody else, another perfect fifth. Wizard of Oz. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'll buy that. All right, cool. Yes, sir. Mm, uh, oh, yes, but just, that's descending. Ba, ba, five, one, one, one. Right, right? Yeah. So, yes, it is a perfect fifth. He's right, it's a descending perfect fifth. Okay, cool. Um, so, so. There's a few other ones, right? I mean, there's many, many other ones. But Star Wars, twinkle, twinkle, little star. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, da, 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 right? Zarathustra from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Da, 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 right? Da, da, perfect fifth. Superman, da, 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 right? On a horn call, like I think I always get a kick out of it. My dad has this uh, 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 on a, when he gets a text message, it's just like, ba -da -da -da, right? Perfect fifth. So all of these things, all these things that we've talked about, have a pretty similar meaning to them. They have a pretty similar meaning to them. Those two, in, that interval, those two notes together, that's excitement. That's adventure. It's an awe-inspiring interval. It's a look into the heavens right kind of interval we've heard all of these things that they all kind of use that sort of that that use that meaning of that interval yes can we kind of uh, can we agree on that yes all right good a lot of things are based off of that so i hope we're on the same page here okay and just like we had said before you know changing major to minor changing chord quality or the interval can completely change the meaning so just like we changed one note from changing from major to minor, and it completely changed the meaning of, of that, of that, the meaning of, of, of that sound effect, right? Okay, so now we can jump in to some Zelda, okay? Okay, so I imagine many of you are familiar with this. Let's give it a listen. Did you know that's two different sound effects? Who knew that? I didn't. It's two different sound effects. <laughs> so, we're gonna talk a little bit about, about this opening chest. So the first thing that we have to talk about it with, with it, well before we get it, actually, first thing we have to talk about is, uh, so we talked about the interval of a perfect fifth. And those of you who aren't music theory people, an interval is just the distance between two notes. Just the, that's all it is, the distance between two notes. And we have a ton of different intervals that we can talk about, but right now we're gonna talk about these two, uh, the two smallest ones that we usually discuss, which are a whole step and a half step. A whole step and a half step, okay? So this is how a whole step sounds. So da, 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 that interval, da, da, that's a whole step, okay? 
And now a half step. Kind of like Jaws, right? Da da. Okay. Da da. Half step. Da da. Whole step. Okay. Got it? We're cool. We're cool. So, what the opening chest theme uses is the whole tone scale. I'm sure some of you probably know about the whole tone scale, but not most of you. The whole tone scale is a six note scale where each note is a whole step apart from every other note. Each note is a whole step apart from every other note. So let's hear how that sounds. Whoa. That's kind of strange, right? It just, it just feels strange. Well, part of that is because because scales that we're used to, we usually ha have things like major and minor stuff. And, and in, major, in, a ma in a major scale or a minor scale, there's a combination of whole steps and half steps. With the whole tone scale, there's no half steps. It's just whole steps. And it ha kind of has this feeling of like suspension to it. So what I think is interesting is that if we listen to like the major scale, like just a G major scale, you guys, I'm sure all of you will recognize it. There's kind of this push from the beginning to the end where it starts on a G and it really, really wants to end on that G. Let's listen. Let's see if we can just kind of feel that momentum. Especially those last two notes. Da, da. If we just ended on da, it would just feel really incomplete. But when we end on da, okay, that's what, oh, we're home. That feels great. But let's listen to the G whole tone scale, and this is just going to be extended a bit. Where's home base? Oh, God. Right? It's, it's very strange. So what this, what this uses over here, this is the first little bit written out. The, uh, this sound effect uses uh, the first four notes of the whole tone scale. And we start on a G, and we go to a C sharp. So that interval right there, that is a little crafty interval called a tritone, and it's kind of spooky sounding. So here's what a tritone sounds like. Ugh! Right? It's a pretty uncomfortable feeling. So. This, this, is a, th this, um, this sound effect uses that extensively, so, and we're going to see that even more. So what happens here, the next little bit we have, is what I like to call chromatic ascension. So chromatic is when notes move by half step, up or down. Notes move by half step, up or down. This is what something that's chromatic sounds like. Another one. There's this. It's just this. This build, right? It's kind of like, it's like a building of tension. It's like when a siren is speeding up, right? Or it's like when you. Uh, it's like in an EDM song before a drop. So, like, you know, right? So, so that kind of a thing. So chromatic. It's a using cr uh, uh, chromatic ascension, ascending by half steps, is a way to build tension. And so what? happens here, this is looking at measure three that happens here. We'll look at the whole thing in just a moment. But what happens here is we have a whole tone group. We have a group of whole tone right here or right here. Whole tone scale, first four notes. And then it just keeps moving up by a half step. So you can even just kind of see that. We have C sharp, C sharp whole tone, moves up by a half step. D whole tone, moves up by a half step. D sharp whole tone, Moves up by half step, right? So that's what just keeps happening here. So let's let's listen to that briefly. Right? We're building tension. So there's there's a lot of things that are building tension right there. We have we have the whole tone scale, we have it outlining a tritone, and we have it moving up. We have it moving up chromatically. So the other thing that's in there is something that's going on with the tempo. What does tempo mean? Who can tell me what the tempo is? 
Yes. Yeah, sure, sure. It's the speed of the music, right? It's just the speed of the music. So what happens there? Does anybody, can anybody tell me what happens with the tempo? Yes, all the way back there. It uh, speeds up ever so slightly. Yeah, it speeds up ever so slightly. There's a word, there's a fancy music school word for that called accelerando, okay? <laughs> so let's just hear, let's just, let's, let's listen to that one more time. Oh, I'll actually, I'll say one other thing before that. There's also another thing that's happening is not only is the tempo speeding up, but a thing called the harmonic rate. The harmonic rate, how often the chords are changing, that's also speeding up. So we have A, you'll see, we'll see this more easily when we have the whole thing on screen, but we have A7 for a while, it moves up to A sharp 7 after two times through, then it keeps moving up two times through, like see, it does two times through this, then it moves up, just two times through, two times through, but then when we get to measure three, one time through, one time through, one time through, one time through, right? So that's increasing the harmonic rate. So increasing the tempo, accelerando, and increasing the harmonic rate. Let's listen. It's two different sound effects, guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so ultimately we're building tension and excitement and all of that. So let's move on to our second half of that, of that little sound effect. So the first thing that we have to understand is what a dominant chord is, a dominant chord. Anybody, anybody familiar with this term? A couple people. Okay, cool, cool, great, great. And that's okay if you're not. That's why we're here. So a dominant chord is when we take a major chord and we add what's called a minor seventh on top of it. When we take a major chord and we add what's called a minor seventh on top of it. And adding that minor seventh creates a tritone between the note that's added and the th what we call the third of the chord. So right here we have an F major chord, FAC. We add an E flat, the minor seventh. And here we have F, A, C, E flat. It's an F7 or F dominant chord. Between the E flat on the top and the A, we have a tritone. So let's hear how that all sounds. So here, you're going to just kind of hear what's up here. So we have an F major chord. We have flat seven. And there's the tritone. So let's hear that just one more time. So we have that in our ear. Major chord. Minor seven, dominant chord, tritone between the seventh of the chord and the third of the chord, the A and the E flat. Okay, cool. So it's kind of like we're adding tension to an otherwise happy chord, right? So what we have here in this next bit is four chromatic, remember moving up by half steps, four chromatic dominant chords. We have an F7 to an F sharp 7 to a G7 to a G sharp 7. All are related chromatically by a half step. So let's hear, let's just hear how that sounds. Whew. So, <laughs> yeah, fi finally, finally. Okay. So what I think is interesting about that is just that it, it, I think that's interesting about that is we have this, this sort of tense sound as the triumphant ending to all of the whole tone stuff that comes before it. That's kind of weird, right? So the other thing I think is interesting, which we'll, we'll look at in just a moment, is that where we started initially was an A, like we started on like kind of like an A7 chord essentially, and where we end up is a G sharp, which is a half step lower. So that means we went through all 12 notes, but we don't even get back to A. That's, it's, that's kind of weird. We do, we, there's never like a point of, of home base right there. We don't arrive home at the very end. We arrive a half step below where we started. It's kind of strange. So I feel like this is, it's like we found something, but is it what we wanted? So let's, let's look at this whole thing and listen through and see how much of that we can catch. So just, to, uh, just as kind of a little reminder, where are you? There you are, okay. We have these whole tone groupings. 
right? And they're, they start by doing two at a time, and then they do two at a time, two at a time, two at a time, and then they start rushing, still whole tone groupings, up a half step, up a half step, up a half step, really quick, increasing the harmonic rate. And then when we get to the second sound effect, it's four dominant chords in a row. Okay, so let's listen to that. What I think is really interesting about that is that in the original, because that's in earlier uh, games as well. That's in, that's in like A Link to the Past and all of that. And what's interesting is that, let's listen to that for a second. Right? Okay, we've heard that before, yeah? There's no tritone in there. There's no tritone in there. Those are not dominant chords. Those are just major chords. So why did he add a tritone when it got to Ocarina of Time? I don't know. I, this is, I am posing this question to you. I don't know. I think it's really strange because I think it adds, this, it adds more tension to it. It just, by nature, has to add more tension to it. So why is there more tension at this very triumphant moment? I don't know. As, and that's why I feel like it's like, well, is that what we wanted? I don't know. That's strange. So moving on to things that Kondo also does well. Ocarina songs. hey -o. I'm doing all the hits. Okay. So these, I think, are really interesting because sound effects have a limitation, have the limitation of time. You, you only have a couple of seconds to achieve this thing that you want to happen. The Ocarina songs are certainly short, but they have other limitations and constrictions as well. So first off, so compositional limitations, the number of notes. So if they would have given him 12 notes, the world would have been his oyster. We'd have been set. He could have played an A key and it would have been any chord, it would have been great. Okay, didn't give him 12 notes. Okay, did they give him seven notes? Well, then he could have, they probably would have given him a major or minor scale, that would have been really helpful. Don't do that either. Did they give him five notes? Did they? Oh, no, they didn't. Okay, so they didn't give him five notes. So five notes, <laughs> five notes, they probably would have given him, uh, they probably give him a pentatonic scale or something like that, which a lot of folk music and a lot of uh, uh, pop music is written with. But we don't get five notes. No, 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 no. We only get four notes. We only get four notes. So which notes do we get? Well, we get D, F, A, B, and another D. Okay? We only get four notes. We don't get five notes. We get five pitches, but we only get four notes. We only get a third of what's available to us in the Western scale, right? So that's, that's tough. That's not an easy thing to do. And the other thing that's tough about this is that built into this, built into these notes, let's, let's hear them. Okay, those are them. Built into these notes, we have a D minor chord, D, F, and A, which is a D minor chord, sounds like this. Okay, and we also have between the F and the B, a tritone. Okay? Woo! So let's hear the, the all in succession again. These are all four notes with another octave. Uh huh. D minor. F to B tritone. Okay. So on the surface, all you can write is dark sounding music. That's all you can write. That's like, what could I do with this? I, if, I, if I have a D, F, and an A, it's probably gonna sound dark. It's probably gonna sound sad. If I have an F and a B somewhere, it's probably gonna sound tense, right? So there are some exceptions. This is what makes life much easier. Number one, he can use any notes after the opening phrase. So like when you first play something and then it triggers and then it tr triggers the rest of the melody. You guys have all played Ocarina of Time, right? Oh, I hope so, I hope. Or Majora's Mask. 
or one of the games that you can play. Okay. You got a lot of options. If, if you don't get one of them, I don't know why you're here. Okay, so, no, stay here, please. Um, okay. So you can, he can write any notes he wants after the opening phrase. He can also use any harmony. What's harmony? Does anybody know what harmony is? Okay, notes that combine with the melody and sound really nice. Any other thoughts on that? Compliments. Uh, uh, uh. I, I was going to say they help define what chord is actually. They help define what chord is actually going on. Cool. These are both great answers. Harmony is when two or more different notes are played simultaneously. In other words, chords. So if you have like if you're if you ever see see excuse me if you ever see a uh, guitarist. Uh, and he's a singer-songwriter or something, he is singing the melody, and he is accompanying himself with the harmony, the chords, right? It doesn't have to be like two singers singing together or two, you know, instrumentalists playing, you know, complementary notes. It doesn't have to be that. It can just be the chords that's played. So, moving on with our, with our ocarina songs. The thing that he does, because he can change the harmony, because he can use other notes other than the, the first, the other, after he plays the initial triggering melody, he can go on from there. Because of that, he can write in different keys. So he writes in minor keys. We'd expect him to write in D minor. So five, five of the tunes in Ocarina of Time, of the 12, five are in D minor. Cool. One's in E minor, which is actually kind of strange. We don't have time to get into it, unfortunately, but that's kind of strange. <laughs> so, but this is also interesting. There's one, there are a couple in D major, which is kind of on its head, like a little strange, because there's an F, but he chooses not to use the F in those situations. Um, in G major, he can rise a couple in G major, one in C major, and then he has one that's really ambiguous, that's kind of strange, called the Nocturne of Shadow, which some of you are hip to. And if you look at the harmony there, it's just, it's all over the place. It's, it's not in any specific key. But strangely enough, it kind of ends in like D flat or something, which doesn't make any sense to what came before it. But regardless, that's, that's song for another day. Okay, so we're going to be talking about Saria's song. So Saria's song, let's all remind ourselves. Bring up, bring up our little sheet music over here. Oh, we'll come back to that. Okay, we have... And that's it, right? That's all we get. So what's interesting about this is how ambiguous, how ambiguous this is. Now I have the chord written, I have the chords, I'm gonna have the chords written in on top of it, but we don't get the chords in the ocarina melody. We don't hear them. We only hear them because of what happened, uh, Lost Woods, is that where? It's the Lost Woods theme? Yeah. By the way, special shout out to my good friend Michelle, because not only is she filming, and she's awesome, but she also like was an invaluable resource to doing this whole thing. So just 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 know that she's awesome. Okay, <laughs> give her a round of applause. Okay. Seriously, I'd be like texting her, like, so does this happen in this game, or like, and she could give me the answer like that. It was great. So awesome. Anyway, so <laughs> so sorry, a song. The interesting thing about here is what we first play is F-A-B, F-A-B. Again, so F, -A F to B, we're outlining a tritone, just like we do in the, just like we do in the, uh, uh, the opening the chest theme, right? So it's kind of ambiguous as to what key this could possibly be in. And so when we get the rest of it, and it's still pretty ambiguous, Partially because where we end on an E minor arpeggio. We end on an E minor arpeggio. Uh, does anybody know what an arpeggio is? Raise a hand, somebody. Uh, uh, uh. Nick, do you know what an arpeggio is? Okay, okay. I might is a good answer. Is it when you take the notes the chord and play them individually? Yeah, exactly. That's all it is. That's all it is. It's when you take the notes of a chord and you play them individually. So if you ever hear a singer warming up and they go, Ba, 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 or something like that, they're singing an arpeggio. They're just singing a chord, but the notes are all played individually. 
So it's kind of weird because like we see this tritone F to B, we see we see this E minor chord at the end. It's very unclear as to what what key we're in. It's it's just not clear. Scale degrees, which we're going to get to in just a moment. So clarity, as I said earlier, only comes in where we hear the in the Lost Woods the background music when it's all harmonized. Let's listen to that for a second. <laughs> That's all we need for now. Okay. So the interesting thing about this is that the interesting thing about this is that we can see that we could tell already that this could potentially be it's it's in C major. I'm telling you guys now it's in C major. The, we could see that uh, 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 that it could be in C major because there's no sharps or flats. Everything everything is a natural note. But I mean, if we look at it, the only time we have a C is right here. We only have one C right there. And to start on the fourth of the key of C, to go to the sixth and then go to the seventh, four, six, seven in the key of C, usually if we're in any sort of major, uh, major tonality, we'll have like one, three, five. That's kind of standard. We'll, we'll start on one, we might, we'll probably end on one, going somewhere with one, three, five, great. But four, six, seven, doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So it's kind of interesting that he chose to make it in C major. I, I think it kind of just turned, it, it kind of puts you through, through a spin, you know? Okay, so moving on from there, let's talk about mood and atmosphere. Mood and atmosphere. And we're gonna talk about the cave music from uh, Link to the Past. Let's listen for a moment. basically repeats. So, believe it or not, that can all be condensed into one measure of music. That's it. That's, that's that whole piece right there in one measure of music. Well, how, how could that possibly be, right? What are we doing there? Well, we have five elements, just like we've been talking about these elements, like just like with the, with the uh, Windows XP. There are five elements going on here. First one we have is this bass bass, what I would like to call power chord. Who, how many people play guitar? A couple people play, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. So in guitar, there's a thing called a power chord, and it's, it's all it is is a perfect fifth. We remember perfect fifth? Remember, it's a perfect fifth played together. This is what a perfect fifth played together sounds like. This is a power chord. That's all the bass is doing. The whole time, that's all that's happening, okay? Then we have... So yeah, so there's the bass. That's all that's going on. So now we have this horn part. Da -da 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 -da. That. Now what's going on here? Oh, excuse me. We're, I'm jumping the gun. I'm jumping the gun. Okay, we have, we have the timpani. We have the timpani going on down here, and it's not really doing much. It's just going bum do 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 bum bum do 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 bum bum. That's all that's going on, whole time. Then we also have this little dripping sound. Okay. And that uh, comes in every once in a while. I think it's like every four measures. Comes every once in a while on three and. So it's like one, two, three and. One, two, drip, drip. Right? That's all that's going on there. And it happens very sporadically, which I think, uh, <laughs> sporadically. Have you guys seen Clueless? Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> Hope not sporadically. Okay, anyway. Those of you who've seen Clueless get that. Anyway, so... <laughs> So anyway, we also have this horn melody going on here. We have the horns right here, going on right here, okay? And it's just, it's a two-part harmony. And here's, the, here's how it's going to sound. So it's going to play the top voice, then the bottom voice, and then together. Here's what's going on. So top voice, bottom voice, together. Again. 
kind of kind of strange. It's just strange. Then we move on to our string part, and this one's all. This one's equally as strange. So it's chromatic, and it has what we call a major second harmony. Uh, the last one was a, a perfect fourth harmony, but don't worry about that. So it has this is a major second harmony. A major second is our, when the notes are a whole step apart. So right here, everything is just moving a whole step apart. So uh, again, the same, same idea. You'll hear the top voice, bottom voice, and then, and then uh, together. So we're looking right here. You're going to hear this, top voice, bottom voice, all together. Bottom voice. That's so cringy, right? So what I think is interesting about all of this is that it's just this one measure. This is, this is all that goes on the entire time until finally something happens. And it was when I kind of perked up and I'm like, oh, geez. That was when everything, the whole thing just moved up by a half step. It's this, all this measure, but then it just moves up by a half step. And which, again, when you, when you move up chromatically, it just builds that tension. And especially when you go up to it and you stay there, and then you go back to a, a still uncomfortable feeling area, it's like, oh, this is perfect for a cave, right? So I like to think of this as the whole is greater, what's going on here? Whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Why is my, okay, well, that'll be okay. I think we'll be okay here. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So let's just listen to that one more time, the whole thing together, and let's see if we can just catch a lot of this stuff going on. Starting out with that power chord, timpani. like it's kind of a when we go back down it's like oh, okay we're kind of in a more comfortable place but not really because we're in a freaking cave <laughs> okay so moving on to the legacy that Kondo has left us and and how how uh, the more modern composers are dealing with that um, specifically we're going to talk about the cave music from Breath of the Wild yay <laughs> okay. okay, let's talk about the cave music from Breath of the Wild. Let's listen for a second. So there are two elements essentially going on there. There's really just two things that are happening. There's a chord. There's a chord on the on beat one of each measure, and it's 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 a pretty it's a pretty crunchy, densely packed chord. And some people may call it a cluster. And any, any, I'm sure some of you music people have heard cluster. And a, and a cluster is is like when you when you just put all, the, like, all these notes like directly on top of each other. If you were to look at it on a keyboard, your, your hands are just like, they're not spread out at all, essentially. And you can even see it on here. Like, the notes are like not spread out. Not everything is just crammed in, in right there. It's a cluster. Okay, so a very densely packed, full of emotion cluster, followed by a two-note melody. So, and, and we're going full circle, guys, a perfect fifth, and actually the same perfect fifth, an A flat to an E flat that we started with. Amazing, okay? So, A flat to an E flat, perfect fifth, and it goes up first, and then it goes back down. Okay, great. So we have that. What I think is interesting about this is I feel like the chords, they, they're telling a story. The chords are telling a story here. 
And part of that is because the first half of, the, of, this, uh, of this little tune is diatonic. Diatonic means that the notes of, that are going on are just, uh, they're, they're only, we're using only notes that are in the key signature. Only notes that are in the key signature. And you can tell uh, this bit repeats again, and, all, and every note has, is, you know, there's no alterations next to it. There's no sharps or flats or anything like that. Yet down here in the second half of the piece, we have flats, we have double flats, okay? We have a lot more chromaticism, okay? I know, and we talked about chromatic being half steps before, which is true, and this is the, uh, just another meaning for it. Chromatic just means notes that are outside of the key signature, okay? And so what I think is interesting here is that the first half is diatonic, and it sounds kind of more pleasant, I guess you could say. Um, and then when it gets to the second half, it's, there's more chromatic, and it's more chromatic, and, and it just sounds darker. And especially where it ends is a very dark place. Um, and it has this chromatically descending bass line. So remember we were talking about moving up chromatically? Well, this bass line, the bottom notes of each chord, it's like da, 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 da. It goes down chromatically by half steps. Okay? So I like to think of it as like moving from, with the perfect fifth and everything, to me it sounds like it's expansive, which makes sense. We're in a cave. That's, that was, that's great imagery. Uh, but as we get deeper into the cave, it gets darker and darker. So let's, let's listen to this. And see if we can let's see if we can feel that now. So we just listen for the two elements, the chords and the melody, and then listen for just how it the 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 emotional aspect of it just changes halfway through. And I'll point it out. It's almost like looking around, right? It's like this exploratory kind of feeling right now. All diatonic. Just very open. But now something happens. <laughs> the question is, am I convincing you? <laughs> okay, so our, we're, 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 we're nearing, we're, we're to our end. But I always like to leave everybody with some writing exercises or some exercises if you, if you want to move into uh, uh, working on compositions in this way. Um, I like to give you guys something to do that with. So writing exercises. Oh, I forgot to animate that, but yes, and if you do them, please send them to me. I'll be very interested to hear them. Okay, so, <laughs> so number one, compose a sound effect or music cue. Compose a sound effect or music cue. And make sure it conveys whether the, whatever action is taking place, as well as how you want the user to feel. Okay? Easy peasy, because I think of things like, you know, you could open a door... Uh, uh, and there can be a sound that relates to that, but what's behind that door? You know what I mean? How do you want the, the, the person to feel as they hear that sound of opening the door? It could, mean, it, could, it could be taken a lot of different ways. So number two, write an ocarina song. Why not? So what I would suggest is first take, you know, choose four notes plus one an octave higher, just like we usually get, like D, F, A, B, D, or, C, or something I was kind of messing around with, C, E, G flat, B flat, C, something like that. The first half of the melody only use the chosen notes, and the second half can be open, just like the limitations that he had. And lastly, harmonize or add chords and give it a great name. Okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then lastly is compose a stage theme using simple el as few simple elements as possible, just like we saw with both of those last two. Oh my God, get out. Um, okay. 
Okay. Um, compose station using as few el simple elements as possible. Just like with those last two, we heard uh, uh, the cave from Breath of the Wild was just a chord followed by a simple melody, and it just keeps repeating that same idea over and over, just in different ways with slight variations. Or uh, the cave uh, theme from, from uh, sorry, Link to the Past, the other one, <laughs> where it's just essentially one measure of music extended over a, a, a longer period of time. And so remember, the whole can be greater than the sum of its parts. And if you guys do any of this stuff, send it over to at music on the DLO. That's me on Twitter and Instagram, at music on the DLO. And if you, if you want to give me a subscribe, that's cool too. <laughs> Cool, so um, that's about it, but uh, we have about 10 minutes left, so if you guys have any questions about anything, I'd be happy to answer them. Let's start back there. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, tell me that one more time. I was like choking for a second. <laughs> Oh, you know, there are certainly there are certainly plenty. Michelle, you would know better than I would. Note flight. Note flight. Note flight. Note flight.com. <laughs> We're not endorsed. We're not sponsored. Okay. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, so that's that's another aspect of it too is that we, you know, we were I was mostly looking at the you know, compositional aspects. Um, that would be more of an orchestration, kind of an orchestration thing. But yeah, certainly. I mean, like, like um, uh, uh, when I hear some of the stuff, like, like uh, for the ATM machine, for example, like the reason, all it is is a lot of times it's just playing one note. It's like da 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 da. But but part of that is the absence of notes before that happens. There's nothing. There's there's no notes I'm hearing before that. And part of it is also that a lot of times it's this gritty, like, nah, nah, nah. because it's gritty, because it has this, like, like you know, that sort of timbre to it, uh, uh, it has a different, it has a different uh, emotional reaction. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, if, you know, if you're going for something, you know, uh, m more sweet sounding, you know, maybe a violin or something like that. It just kind of depends. You know, a lot of that is just, is just listening to music and, and just noting how you're feeling when you're hearing a specific thing. Does that, that make sense? Cool. Yes, sir. So we talked about how a lot of the Ocarina songs are played in major and minor keys. Yeah. Um, but if you look at a song like Serenade of Water, which starts in a Dorian, a minor key, mm -hmm. and then in the second second section, it goes to a major key, and then it goes to a major So I think, as I recall, I think, I'm sorry, what's your question? Oh, <laughs> or okay. If I'm correct, and Michelle will tell me if I'm am, <laughs> if the the uh, all the adult songs end major. I think so. I think those are all the uh, uh, as you're an adult. I think all of them, because I think they the ch child ones. I don't think have any harmony after the trigger is played, and I think that the adult ones do. Like. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe just j to be, for it to be more triumphant at the end or something like that, instead of having everything be as dark and dreary as it sounds. I mean, maybe that has something to do with the setting of the game and, and, uh, uh, you know, it being, you know, it, it's a lot darker as you're older in that game. So it's like maybe it's kind of like the ray of hope at the end or something like that. Okay, cool. Well, cool, cool. Uh, yes, sir. Uh-huh. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir. Do you think that was a really strong change for the series that it needed, or do you prefer the older styles? 
I, I think that I think that considering how how vast the game is than Breath of the Wild is, I feel like it has to be more open. It's like, um, to be fair, now, just mind you, just full disclosure, I don't own a Switch. I haven't played through Breath of the Wild. Okay? I know. I know. How, who, who's this asshole? Okay. So, but I like to think of it like, like I would think of Final Fantasy XV, which is near to, dear to my heart, and I have played. Um, but like the idea is that in that game, in Final Fantasy XV, you're not uh, there's not music all the time. You, you there's there's music if you're like going out into the wilderness. There's music for a time, and then there's you don't get anything for until something else happens. And so I think creating that sort of open atmosphere, that open world, I think it it, it works with that. You know, I just saw this. I just saw this, uh, I was watching some Breath of the Wild videos and somebody was showing me, or they were, they did a, they, f they flew in some, all the way from one end of the map to the other end of the map. And like, it is ginormous. It is huge. Like, so I think that a game that big, you can't have these little like, like just tunes. You know what I mean? Like these just triumphant, fun, little adventurous tunes. You need something that's wide open. You know, like that. That would be my, that's my opinion on it. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Um, I would love to hear your analysis on that Ocarina of Song Wii Viper. <laughs> on, 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 which one? The one that's in E minor. Oh, the one that's in E minor. Well, here's, here's just, the, here's kind of the short, the short thing about it. it. Is that you have D, F, A, and B, okay? Uh, in a minor, key, in any minor key, in any in any major or minor key, we're usually going to play notes that uh, we're usually going to start and end melodies on like one, three, or five. Those are kind of our main goalposts, right? Typically speaking, we have D, which is a seventh in E minor. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to start to start a melody on. We have two of those, right? So that doesn't really work too well. We have an F, which is flat two, so we don't even really have that in E minor. It's just that's a chromatic note. We have A, which is the eleventh or the fourth. That's kind of weird to start on. We have the B, which is the fifth. That only really that's the only one that really makes a lot of sense. So there's the fact that we have the options open to us are the seventh, the fourth, and the fifth. It's just kind of a weird place to have the melody reside in, a, in E minor. Like, it's just like, that's, that's strange, you know? But he, he does a great job with it, and I think that's what's interesting about it. Um, anybody else? Yes? Uh, the Nocturne of Shadow. No, no, excuse me, that's not. Uh, the one in E minor, um, I'd have to look it up. Get, get to me at the end. I'll, I'll be happy to look it up for you. Uh, uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. So uh, I'm currently going to college for uh, game design, and I'm also, um, you know, I'm a musician in my spare time, just playing in bands and stuff. Cool. Would you be opposed to somehow posting this, uh, you know, PowerPoint somewhat online? Where, where I'm filming it now. Post the PowerPoint. Don't don't you worry. If you follow me, <laughs> at music on the D-Lo. <laughs> <laughs> D, and by the way, D Lo is D L O because my last name is Lopatka and doesn't have a W in it. So music on the D Lo. If you find me on Instagram, find me on Twitter, you will hear all about this panel and I will post it. Don't you worry. Or you can follow my YouTube channel, which is also music on the D Lo. Whoa. Yeah. Heyo, branding. Okay. Yes. I think you're probably. Which one? Minuet of. You're probably right. We'll look. We'll look. We'll find it out. Oh. I, I, I'll double check, but you, you, you're very well. I'm sure you're right. Yes. Okay. Any other, any other questions? Anything else? Well, thank you guys so, so much. I appreciate it. If you have anything you want to talk about, feel free to come up. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you.